Cafe Pacific returns to the black, making a net profit of $9.78 billion. Lawmakers finish scrutinizing all 181 clauses of the Safeguarding National Security Bill. And in the U.S., Joe Biden and Donald Trump clinched their party's presidential nominations. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Cathay Pacific returned to the black in its 2023 earnings report with a net profit of nearly $9.8 billion. This marks not just the first profitable year for Cathay since 2019, but also the highest profits earned by the airline since 2010. But Cathay is still struggling to hire pilots and meet the target to fully recover its flight capacity. After the city lifted all pandemic-related travel restrictions more than a year ago, Cathay Pacific is making a strong recovery. Its annual net profit in 2023 stood at $9.78 billion. Passenger services revenue surged more than 300% year-on-year to $61.4 billion. But cargo profits fell 16% to $25.6 billion. Overall, the city's flagship carrier not just reversed hefty losses in the previous three consecutive years, but also earned the most since 2010. The turnaround also restored the company's dividend payout for the first time with its directors recommending an interim dividend of 43 cents per share. Our results in 2023 were driven by the strong pent-up demand for travel. However, inflationary pressure along the entire aviation supply chain has persisted since the pandemic and will continue to have an impact on airfares. In an internal memo, Cathay's management announced that eligible employees will receive a bonus worth 7.2 weeks pay. Last year, it paid the government $1.97 billion in preference share dividends, and it plans to buy back the remainder of the shares by the end of July. On restoring flight capacity. We are now in the middle of our rebuild journey. Uh, the rebuild will take roughly two years, and uh, our projection is that uh, within quarter two 2024, we'll uh, build back 80% of our passenger flights. But it has pushed back the target for restoring pre-pandemic capacity by three months to early 2025. Cathay explained that's due to a manpower crunch. The group needs 500 more pilots who will be trained over the coming year, and it will continue to review the remuneration packages to retain the pilots. Cathay is also planning to hire 5,000 workers this year. Recruitment drive for flight attendants will continue on the mainland, but the majority of crew members will still be from Hong Kong. Lawmakers have finished scrutinizing all 181 clauses of the Safeguarding National Security Bill after six days of intensive meetings spanning 38 hours. Martin Liao, chairman of the Legislative Council Bills Committee, announced all clauses of the bill have been examined and explained. Secretary for Security Chris Tang confirmed that's correct. The legislative process will move to the next stage as the government will table amendments to the bill in LegCo. U.S. President Joe Biden and predecessor Donald Trump have secured enough delegates to win their party's 2024 presidential nominations. This sets the stage for the first U.S. presidential election rematch in 70 years. David Garrett reports. It will be former President Donald Trump against current leader Joe Biden in November. It has seemed inevitable for months, if not years. A rerun of the 2020 election, which Biden won, although Trump disputed, now they're going to do it all again. On a campaign stop earlier this week, Biden looked relaxed as he made jokes about his main rival. As the incumbent, it was always likely that he would be the Democratic candidate for re-election. Biden secured the nomination uh, after defeating token challengers within his party, uh, never really facing a true threat to his ability to, uh, to claim his party's mantle uh, going into November. Biden faces a much bigger challenge in Donald Trump, who has dominated the Republican nominee race. There are concerns over Biden's age at 81, his memory and mental capabilities. Although only four years younger, Trump fares better with voters when this question arises. While Donald Trump has won Republican primary contests by big margins, there are some warning signs for him ahead in the general election. The voters in the Republican primaries tend to be more conservative, and the voters in the general election are going to be a much more diverse group of people that Donald Trump is going to have to appeal to. 
Trump comes into the election with unprecedented legal challenges. Four criminal cases, including 91 charges, and he was found liable by a jury for sexual abuse. Trump says it's all a smear campaign against him. The two nominations were secured when several locations, including here in Georgia, held primaries. Both Biden and Trump passed the delegate threshold for their parties. These voters in Atlanta weren't sure who they'll vote for in November or if they want either. I'm a very like, solidly Democratic voter, um, and I'm finding it very hard to imagine voting for Biden at this point, um, given everything with immigration and also with the way he's managed, mismanaged Palestine um, and Gaza. It's not just one blown up charge. It's I don't know how many cases are out there, four, six, I don't even remember. And it's all over the country. I mean, no, I'm definitely not. And if he's convicted of a crime, then no one should vote for him. In Seattle, more voters in a primary in Washington state. In eight months' time, these people, like the rest of the US, will have to think about who they want in Washington, D.C. Voters spoke openly about their apathy for both candidates. Many people are looking back through American history to see if there are examples that are similar uh, to this. And there are not very many. There's one example from the uh, 1880s and early 1890s where Grover Cleveland and Benjamin Harrison, neither household names, uh, had this sort of uh, incumbent uh, uh, challenger rematch. Uh, and there are only six other times in American history when we've had the same two people confront each other uh, twice for the presidency. And so uh, this is quite rare. So an unusual but not unprecedented race for the presidency. It's the rematch, the sequel, Biden versus Trump 2. David Garrett, TVB News. A top EU official has been critical of Israel's disruption of aid distribution into Gaza, saying they are creating a man-made humanitarian disaster. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu shrugged off the criticism and vowed to plow on with attacks on Hamas, saying he will target Rafah even though the U.S. does not support this. David Garrett reports. At the UN, the foreign policy chief of the European Union said his organization is sending aid to starving Palestinians, but it is more difficult than it needs to be. Humanitarian assistance needs to get into the Gaza, and the European Union is uh, working as much as we can in order to make it possible. But this is a humanitarian crisis which is not a natural disaster. It's not a flood. It's not a earthquake. It's a man-made. An EU-sponsored aid vessel left Cyprus bound for Gaza on Tuesday. It's hoped 200 tonnes of food will be delivered by sea in the next 48 hours. But Burrell questioned why parachute drops and aid flotillas are needed. We have to do it because the natural way of providing support through roads is being closed, artificially closed. And starvation is being used as a war arm. And when we condemn this happening in Ukraine, we have to use the same words for what's happening in Gaza. Some Palestinians in Gaza are skeptical about the impending arrival of aid. Hanan Halak from Khan Yunis has heard about the ship, but does not believe it's for support, but about further displacement. <laughs> Trucks are at crossings and the Jews do not agree. Suddenly they agree, Hanan asked. The Rafa crossing is available. There is the Karem Abu Salem crossing, the Erez crossing. This port is a plot. Israel's military showed its troops allowing and coordinating some food trucks into northern Gaza. This, as their leader once again said he plans a heavy offensive in the southern city of Rafa. We will destroy Hamas, free our hostages, and ensure that Gaza doesn't ever pose a threat to Israel again. We will finish the job in Rafah while enabling the civilian population to get out of harm's way. With so many civilians, including children, already displaced in and around Rafah, the White House has raised concerns about whether Netanyahu can achieve his goals humanely. A journalist asked the White House National Security Advisor whether the US government would set conditions. The president has been very clear about our position on Rafa, and our position is that a military operation in Rafa that does not protect civilians, that cuts off 
the main arteries of humanitarian assistance and that places enormous pressure on the Israel-Egypt border is not something that he can support. Despite US concerns and EU criticism, another strike hit central Gaza early Wednesday. Medics said 10 died, including children. Dead bodies were counted as they were carried away. David Garrett, TVB News. Still ahead. The U.S. House of Representatives to vote later tonight on a bill that could lead to a ban against TikTok. Chinese university researchers warn that patients with periodontitis have a high risk of developing stomach cancer. And treasures newly put on display at the Palace Museum. Welcome back. The U.S. House of Representatives plans to vote on a bill within the next few hours that could lead to a ban against a popular video app TikTok in the United States. U.S. lawmakers are concerned that the company is a threat to national security. TikTok's parent company ByteDance has its headquarters in Beijing. On Tuesday, influencers in their droves were in Washington, D.C. at an advocacy event in support of TikTok. Tracy Furness has more. Short video app TikTok is used by about 170 million people in America. But tonight, the U.S. House of Representatives plans to vote on a bill that, if passed, would require Chinese-owned ByteDance to divest TikTok and other applications it owns within six months of the bill's enactment or face a ban on the apps in the United States. Lawmakers have expressed uh, concerns that the data of Americans that is on the app, 170 million Americans that use TikTok, could potentially be forced uh, over to the Chinese government. The bill must be supported by two-thirds of the House for it to pass. The Senate would also need to pass the measure, and President Joe Biden has said if Congress passes the bill, he will sign it. Back in 2020, then U.S. President Donald Trump signed an executive order banning TikTok, but it was blocked by the federal courts after the company sued. When the Biden administration came in, they revoked the executive order, but allowed a foreign investment review to continue within the administration. The House vote at 10 p.m. Hong Kong time. TikTok has long denied it could be used as a tool of the Chinese government. The fight over the platform comes as US-China relations have shifted to that of strategic rivalry, especially in areas such as advanced technologies and data security. Tracy Furness, TVB News. A warning on possible gum-to-gut health risks. That's from a recent research conducted by the medical school at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, which found patients with periodontitis, a common tooth gum disease, have a higher chance of developing stomach cancer. Take a listen. Periodontitis refers to the serious inflammation of your gums and bone that support your teeth, typically caused by poor oral hygiene and dental habits. Now that can also cause cancer all the way down in your stomach. A CUHK research team began a study on the relationship between streptococcus bacteria and gastric cancer five years ago. They found the bacteria can survive in an acidic environment, like one's gut. Usually those infected with H. pylori, a common type of bacteria that attacks the stomach lining, have the risk of stomach cancer doubled or tripled. The research team found such risk is ramped up further with the infection of streptococcus bacteria, which often comes with decayed teeth or periodontal disease. The bacteria can go into the gut with swallow saliva and induce cancer. Joseph Song, emeritus professor of the Department of Internal Medicine and Therapeutics from CHK's Faculty of Medicine, noted that tooth and throat-related bacteria could even cause not just stomach cancer, but also colon cancer. With that, the research team reminds the public it's pivotal for them to take care of their oral hygiene to minimize such risks. The researchers added the next step will be to consider analyzing the stomach lining of gastric cancer patients and come up with plans to treat the ailment. The Hong Kong Palace Museum will showcase around 100 items in its new private collection exhibition starting on Friday. Visitors will be able to check out an eclectic range of treasures from ancient Chinese jewelry to 20th century European clocks. Timothy Lee reports from the museum. Art lovers can feast their eyes upon the Hong Kong Palace Museum's latest exhibition, featuring donations by collectors who are united by the desire to promote Chinese culture. 
Treasures on display at the exhibit include this headdress with a dragon motif dating back to the Ming Dynasty, as well as a number of tiger paintings by Chinese painter and activist Wu Chaobun. The 20th century artist traveled across Russia and Japan in hopes of capturing the true nature of the feared predator through his brush. Besides collections originating from China, the exhibition also showcased items originating from Europe, such as this early 20th century French locomotive clock. Once broken, the clock became operational again after extensive restoration work performed by specialists from the Palace Museum in Beijing. To me, this is a textbook collection. Diverse, right? But also best of the best. So if you look at some of the Neolithic parts, so these are like the, these represent the peak of Chinese art at the time. If you look at the Ming and Qing porcelains behind me, these represent the pinnacle uh, of ceramic production in China. So uh, Chinese art is long and illustrious. Wang also revealed how the Palace Museum is working with international partners to promote Chinese art and culture abroad. That we are working very closely with two major French museums and institutions to stage two major exhibitions this year to celebrate the China and France 60th anniversary of diplomatic relations. Meanwhile, the museum also presented 20 new sets of artwork in its Ming Dynasty exhibition. Some standout pieces include this painting of legendary military strategist Zhuge Liang by Emperor Xuanda himself. Here, visitors can also find a number of works by Tang Bo Hu, one of the most celebrated artists in Chinese history. The artwork will be on public display starting today until the 2nd of June. Among the precious items featured at the Hong Kong Palace Museum exhibition are these Tibetan Tanka paintings, which were popularized in China when the royal family in the Qing Dynasty adopted the Tibetan Buddhist faith. The Palace Museum said it will organize more exhibitions featuring diverse treasures from around the world. Timothy Lee, TVB News. A UK-born sustainable fashion advocate has founded a non-profit organization in Hong Kong, which sets its sights on giving clothing waste a new lease of life. Christina Dean also shared with TVB News her vision in championing an ecosystem for lasting changes in the fashion industry. It's not your regular clothing shop. This fashion store under nonprofit organization Redress receives supplies from secondhand clothing programs citywide. With the fashion brand upcycling textile waste, they aim to showcase the aesthetic and logistical possibilities of sustainable fashion. Join them on the front line. At Apart from a savvy online presence to reach out to the wider audience. The group also hosts design competitions with entries from aspiring eco-focused designers around the world. This collection was um, creating garments that are made from waste but don't look like it. And I think uh, sustainability does not always have to look like the garments are made from waste. When we are recycled it from the factory, it's basically maybe very cheap. But after they come to the market, they can be in a high-end luxury brand. It is really wonderful to see you all. Christina Dean founded the nonprofit organization in 2007 with hopes to remedy and set right a future for fashion, just as its name Redress suggests. Young designers have a lot of passion to do the right thing when it comes to design, and they use the and they use the design board as a place to exert their hopes for the world. And so when we see them design, they're designing in a whole different way, because ultimately what they want to do is prove that you can have beautiful clothes that don't cost the earth. Originally from the UK, Christina also chose Hong Kong to set up redress for a strategic position, both geographically and in the global fashion industry. Hong Kong has such a powerful fashion industry and it is within a five-hour flight of half of the world's population. We have the whole of APAC production so close to Hong Kong. So Hong Kong's fashion industry is very influential in its reach to the supply chain and also as a sort of leader in driving aspirational thoughts around sustainability and practices that can actually reach way above and beyond just Hong Kong. The application for their design awards this year is open until March 15th. Emerging sustainable fashion designers from around the world, age 18 or above, with less than four years of professional experience, can submit their designs and sketches that use low-impact materials and low-waste processes to the competition. And that's the news. Thank you for watching.